Welcome to the series Probability of Default, and thank you for joining uh, this event. Um, my name is Rafael Castillo Triana, uh, and uh, briefly, I, I can give you uh, my professional credentials. I am a lawyer educated under uh, civil law, uh, living in the United States since 1997, uh, and working uh, around across my life in the financial sector and in particular in the equipment financing uh, sector. I have been in the last uh, 30 years uh, as a legal uh, and business consultant uh, working, and I'm currently affiliated to one of the most important uh, consulting firms uh, in the equipment leasing financing arena. Uh, this series of uh, probability of default uh, were inspired by uh, the effort that I took uh, last year to write a book about probability of default. Uh, what motivated the writing of the book was the observation about uh, the uh, effects of the pandemic in, uh, in the equipment leasing and financing industry. And, um, and one of the, of the key situations that uh, the pandemic uh, uh, represented uh, for us was uh, the fact that uh, since the world has been stopping, uh, one of the things that could uh, essentially happen was uh, that uh, the risk, the credit risk was going to, uh, to uh, grow uh, and probably we were not prepared for that. Um, and working with civil, uh, different projects with the banking industry and uh, my clients in the, in the equipment leasing and financing industry, I came to, to the realization that we we'll know very little about uh, what is probability of default. And it happens that probability of default is one of the key areas that uh, have to do with uh, not only our business, but also our lives. So borrowing from uh, Adam Grant on uh, this interesting uh, experience, uh, I decided that is the right time to start learning again. Uh, that means that uh, even if we have been uh, working for many years, even if we have uh, a, a PhD in certain discipline, uh, going through masters and of course, uh, the undergraduate studies and, and everything that, uh, that education could have provided to you, uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think that the Greeks were uh, in the right path when they say that uh, I only know that I know nothing. Um, and one of the things that, uh, that uh, inspire uh, this uh, series, and of course, uh, the, the way as the, as the book was written, is to recognize that uh, we need to start learning again. Um, Adam Grant, who wrote this interesting book called Think Again, which I also recommend, uh, is a, a professor of, of the Wharton School, and he narrates the fact that a survey was conducted in Wharton uh, among students um, about what was the best teaching method. And uh, students uh, basically voted when the, uh, among the alternative of uh, whether you learn more with a lecture or with an active learning session. Uh, they run into the conclusion that the learning active session was, uh, was boring and a good lecturer was the best uh, alternative for them. And that created and that, that uh, led to the point where uh, they voted that uh, uh, lecturers were, were uh, a better option for learning uh, the business. It turns out that uh, in the final exams, uh, the, the ones that uh, learn in active uh, sessions were very, better performers than the one that got uh, a very interesting lecturer. So that uh, drives into the conclusion that uh, it is better to learn with the lecturer than learning from the lecturer. And that is my invitation today. I, inv I invite you that uh, you join me in uh, my ignorance. Uh, we, uh, ignorance is basically lack of knowledge with willingness to get out of, uh, of the lack of knowledge. So every time we walk, uh, we are learning new things. And I, I'm sharing with you the journey I already started, but uh, is not yet finished. So getting into the default concept and the risk of default, uh, 
some thoughts are interesting to share. Uh, one is we are exposed to the risk of default from the point that we can be victims of the risk of default, but also we can be victims of being judged to be a risk of default. For the first part, I mean, being exposed to the risk of default, that may happen in several aspects of our lives. It can happen with our work. I mean, we can lose our work um, and we can uh, not be compensated for what we do if our client defaults. Mm. So in, uh, in this uh, uh, chart, you could see uh, the illustration. What happens is if Uber goes out of business, how many people will be victim of the default of Uber? Now, there is another exposure that we have to default. We decide to save and invest our savings in companies that are listed in recognized stock exchanges. Uh, well, what happens if the companies where we invest fall into default? Can we lose our money completely? We may, and it can happen also to a bank. We have two recent cases or three recent cases, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, Sterling Bank, and uh, well, Credit Suisse. Uh, and the point is that uh, how do we know that the bank uh, where we have the money uh, is really solid and cannot default? Well, in the case of the examples that we mentioned, the governments of the countries, the US government, the Swiss government came to the rescue, but uh, it doesn't happen in all the cases. And last but not least, if you are an employee, uh, that happened, for example, to the employees of Enron some years ago, yeah, your employer might, might default and you may lose your salary. So this is the first side of the, of the, the coin. The, the flip side of the coin goes into when you are perceived as a risk of default. And uh, in my case, I have uh, experienced frustration uh, because I believe that my banking institutions, they don't judge my ability to pay and my willingness to pay uh, in the right way. Uh, and that's because we are going to see that they use some uh, tools that are not necessarily linked to reality. Uh, certainly the credit bureaus, the banks, the credit rating agencies and the investment analysts uh, base their judgments in concepts that most of them fail to understand. And this is part of the journey that we're going to, to, uh, to make today. So that's the reason why we need to gather the, the knowledge together. Now, if you are in the financing business, if you are in the banking business, for example, I have a question for you, which is whether or not you have your own credit culture. And for that, I'm going to borrow the definition of culture that uh, Edgar Schein had in his uh, book, uh, Organizational uh, Challenge and, 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 and Corporate Culture, uh, with basically a culture is the, the result of shared learnings. Uh, when people get together to solve a common threat or common problem, or they get together to realize a certain common project, a dream. Uh, and they get together learning again. Uh, the learnings that are shared by the group uh, become beliefs, things that, uh, that work and things that don't work. That goes into, I believe that this works, I believe that it, it doesn't work. And eventually they go into different levels of importance, hierarchies, and that creates the scale of values. And that's what a culture is all about. Now, if we transfer that into the credit culture, the question is, do you apply you, what you have learned? Do you apply what the, in your case have worked and has failed to work? Do you have a hierarchy of values when you can really put some importance to certain aspects that are related to your learnings? And the sad answer to that question is that in most of the cases, that is not the case. What happens is that most of the large financial institutions, they decide to go to a comfort zone, which is borrowing someone else's credit culture. So they borrow from Standard & Poor's, from Moody's, from Fitch Ratings, from uh, Crawl Bond Rating Agency, which is a former Duffin Phelps. But at the end of the day, when you ask the chief credit officer, the chief risk officers, what do they understand about the methodologies they apply from any of these uh, very well reported providers? Uh, 
they cannot give you an explanation because they don't understand why it works. They only know that it works. So today, I think that it's important to put you in context. Uh, we learned about probability science in the past six episodes. I think that we learned or we started learning. And we also learned in our episode number six about the positive psychology school, uh, which give us a lot of important tools to judge character as one of the key components of credit risk culture. Now we need to learn how these uh, concepts of probability uh, relearn, apply to how we measure probability of default. And this is the place where geometry and physics meet financing. So we have uh, here the confluence where Newton and Euclid meet Adam Smith. And we'll see now the concept that has been developed in the body of knowledge of civilization, what we have learned, what it comes to us, which will land into our understanding about how we can measure probability of default. So let me give you uh, an idea of what has been our journey uh, to date. We, we started our journey landing into the concept and in, uh, in the first chapter of, of the book, in the first episode that we had in this series of, of webinars, uh, I mentioned that uh, as a lawyer, I started uh, my contact with default just dealing with defaulted situations. I mean, we started in a, in a kind of forensic practice, uh, understanding default from the point where it was already a fact, a consummated fact. And that fortunately gave the ability to reverse engineer how can you avoid falling victim of default. Uh, that is a little bit, uh, it's a kind of anecdotal part, uh, what, how we, we got into that. And then we needed to define what default is all about. And, and ultimately default has to do with broken promises. I mean, you are expected that someone is going to behave as they promise you under a promissory note, for example, that's then the reason why a promissory note is called promissory. Uh, but eventually they defaulted because they broke the promise. And that took us into understanding how the probability theory came into the body of knowledge. And that was very interesting because it happened that the, uh, the word and, and humankind for many centuries believed that everything that happened in the future was the design of God or design of the gods. And eventually, to a certain point of time, mankind started to say, wait a minute, I may probably anticipate what is going to happen or what may happen in the future. So that gave to different discussions and discoveries, interesting discoveries that we, of course, uh, walk in, in the corresponding episode number three about theory of probability. And we landed into the fascinating story of uh, the Chevalier Fermat, uh, Blaise Pascal, and uh, the Chevalier de Mere and, 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 uh, Paul and, and, and Fermat, and how the probability theory went into, into knowledge. Uh, we, go, we went through a Fibonacci as well, how uh, math came into our body of knowledge as well. It's part of how the word, how mankind, got used to the analysis of probability at large. Then we realized that uh, after learning about probabilities and the law of large numbers and everything that came there and how the, the insurance industry was born, uh, we needed to define how we could use our skills in the game. And the first side of that was how can we build together a risk appetite framework? Then we got the visit of Daniel Bernoulli with a very interesting contribution to that point. I think that this is something that you will find uh, in the book and you are going to find in episode number four and number five. Then last episode, we uh, touched the issue about the neglected analysis of character, uh, which basically shows that uh, most of the institutions, they rely on what credit bureaus provide as, as the key information of, of character, uh, the credit scoring that comes from that. Uh, but we, we, we saw how uh, inaccurate that could become and uh, the waste of what the psychology 
science has uh, contributed to this uh, analytical tool. So I hope that episode number six uh, contributes to very much for changing a little bit the approach that everyone takes about uh, analyzing probability of default. Today, we are going to focus on in this episode, calculating the distance to default and what are the approaches that he has been taking up to date. Next episodes are going to analyze how regulators uh, are taking uh, the approach of uh, priority of default. And finally, the end of our learnings is how we can build a credit scoring model based on what we have learned in all this journey. Now, if you are in a hurry and you want to, to uh, go in the journey faster than we can go through these episodes, well, I encourage you to go to Amazon and get the book. Uh, that will also help me a lot because of course, uh, as an author, I receive royalties from, from the book. Uh, but, uh, and just to mention, uh, uh, I am using a nom de plume called uh, Ralph uh, Castle, but uh, well, uh, it's, it's, it's me basically who wrote the book. Uh, but I hope that uh, this is just the beginning of a joint learning process. And again, I recognize that I'm totally ignorant. Today, we are going to, uh, to focus on how to calculate the distance to default. And, and the best parallel I find here, and you will see why, is a parallel of a pond, a pond that it can be full of water or has a certain level of water, and a pond that ha is com completely empty. And I dare to say that when the, the liquidity turns dry is when we are in the, in the, in the uh, border of default. So in order to ca calculate the distance to default, we can use the calculation of the volume of quote unquote water that the pond has until it empties. And this is a key concept. You know, the methodology of calculating distance and movement are the key concept of calculus. And uh, that takes us a little bit to some part of our episode number three. In episode number three, we were telling the story of the gentleman to the left uh, uh, or to the light of the, of the, of the picture, which is uh, uh, a known uh, author called Herman Walks. And the gentleman to... Uh, mm, my right from the perspective on, on the left of the, of the image, uh, Professor Richard Feynman. And, and the story goes like this. Uh, Herman Walk was uh, a writer. Uh, his project was to write uh, a second version of uh, War and Peace, uh, emulating uh, Leon Tolstoy, uh, uh, regarding the Second World War. So he, uh, as a matter of fact, he wrote two books. One of them became a, a very well-known uh, series uh, called Winds of War. Uh, and in that uh, uh, tale, uh, he started uh, researching uh, several aspects of the war. And one of them was the Manhattan Project. I mean, the group of scientific that uh, put together the atomic bomb. Uh, so he, he went into, into uh, uh, the, 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 the Los Alamos Institute where, where the, the Manhattan Project was sitting and he met several of, uh, of the scientists. The youngest one was Professor Richard Feynman, and they developed an interesting uh, friendship. Uh, Feynman was not an easy guy. He was a really a, a real genius. You'll see how you know, everything that we learn about quantum uh, computing, quantum physics, and so on, uh, Richard Feynman is there. Uh, and when they were finishing the interview, Richard Feynman asked uh, Herman Walker, uh, do you know what the language God talks? And, and uh, Herman Walk asked him, well, actually, I, I, I don't. I mean, are you talking about Aramil? He said, no, the, the language God talks is calculus. Is the way as God has expressed what happens in the world. Uh, and the interesting part of that is that that uh, motivated uh, Herman Walk to take, uh, to relearn calculus. And he wrote a book uh, that is called The Language God Talks. And he writes exactly how the story went through, which is a, a very interesting book because it also uh, calls us in a way to uh, relearn what probably was very boring for us during the time we were in, in high school and college uh, about calculus. But calculus is absolutely critical uh, because it's a tool to calculate complex distances. And this is one of the things that we are uh, trying to do when we calculate the probability of default. 
So we need to invite to this party uh, two gentlemen uh, who actually were, uh, they live at the same time. Uh, they develop uh, uh, the concept of calculus at the same time. Uh, they accuse each other of uh, stealing the work from the other, uh, but uh, the finally, uh, you know, history has uh, shown that they started and they learned same things from different perspectives at the same time without any uh, contact with them at the beginning. Uh, later on, of course, they, they met and, and they have the chance to redevelop that. But they develop uh, the systematic methods of modern calculus. And the way they did that uh, was splitting every single problem, especially calculating distances and movement, uh, splitting everything into little pieces. Uh, so once they got the answer uh, after splitting everything in little pieces, which is uh, what we call the differential side of calculus, so they started assembling these pieces again, uh, and they assembled that, these pieces using the concept of infinite and uh, getting into the infinite uh, uh, as, a, as a way to uh, relate how things could happen. One of the things that one of the, the applications they did was calculating, for example, the area of a circle, uh, just splitting uh, the, the different and they uh, use the example of a pizza, the different triangles that you can, uh, when you uh, split a pizza in different pieces, uh, the more triangles you get, the more it tends to, to become a kind of a parallelogram. And with that, they were able to calculate um, just the area of circles and, and many other applications of that. Uh, this is important because we are going to, to see how this simple methodology, and again, I'm a lawyer, I'm not an expert in math. A lot of, of you, I'm pretty sure, that have a better knowledge of math. But this was a very interesting approach that we can take in order to understand distance to default. Now, we need the help of uh, three guys, uh, or actually, it were four, four guys, uh, in order to, to move forward and understand a little bit more, uh, more these concepts. One of them, key of that, was Pythagoras. And uh, without Pythagoras, uh, I can dare to say to you that you wouldn't have ways, for example. You wouldn't have the ability to, uh, to open your application in, uh, in your phone and see a map that is going to calculate distances for you and is going to tell you at what time you are expected to arrive to your destination. How do they do that? Well, they do that using Pythagoras triangle because the way as you can calculate uh, any uh, distance is by using the known distance that are usually the, the side of, of, of the triangle. And then the so-called hypotenuse is going to, to give you the distance that you are going to, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to walk or to drive. And uh, this in little triangles is exactly what the algorithm of Waze or the algorithms or, uh, or Google Maps do, the, do for you. Now, the other uh, player that is going to help us is Archimedes of Syracuse. Uh, if you remember what we got in in uh, in uh, episode number three, the, the story of Archimedes is really uh, a very interesting story. He was uh, a Greek uh, living in the island of Syracuse at the time when the Roman Empire was trying to conquer the former uh, domains of the Greeks. Uh, but uh, because of his uh, uh, ingenuity, uh, a lot of things happen. Plutarch, for example, tells the story that uh, using levers, uh, the population of Syracuse was able to uh, defeat uh, the navy of the Romans uh, because uh, uh, with a hook, the lever was able to uh, turn up all the, the ships and, uh, and the sailors uh, fell down to the water, uh, believing that it was a kind of monster that was uh, defending Syracuse. Uh, the sad story is that uh, Finally, uh, Archimedes was uh, killed by a soldier because uh, uh, the boss, uh, the general, uh, wanted to, uh, to meet uh, Archimedes, but uh, at the moment when the soldier wanted him to, to uh, join him, uh, Archimedes was very, very focused in solving a problem. Uh, the soldier became a little bit impatient and killed him. Uh, but the most important uh, contribution of Archimedes of Syracuse, we're going to see that, 
is what uh, made him uh, uh, get out of, uh, of the bathtub when he discovered the pressure of liquids as a key to calculate the volume of water that goes out of any recipient. So you can see where we go. If we use Archimedes methodology, combine what we will learn from this uh, gentleman, certainly we will be able to calculate at what speed and how much water can get out of the pond. I will get a little bit later to understand exactly what that is. René Descartes and Pierre de Fermat, <clears throat> they introduced a Cartesian, uh, which is basically using geometry to help us understand the complicated problems of algebra. And that became very useful. But Fermat contributed to something which was even better, which was the possibility to, to understand the behavior of curves uh, using the support of the tangent to the curve. And that was called the methodology of uh, optimization. That is what we use when we are trying to put our uh, hand back into, into the uh, into the planes, uh, how we can accommodate them in the in, on the top of our seats. So what they contributed to that? Certainly, Pythagoras with the theorem uh, and creating this very uh, simple principle that the sum of the areas of uh, two squares on the legs equals the area of the square of the hypotenuse, and that led to the law of cosine and, and sine which exactly give us uh, a very good uh, key to calculate distances. Archimedes then calculated the weight uh, and volume by the displacement of a given volume of water. Uh, he was tasked at that time by uh, the, the king of Syracuse to check whether or not one of the artisans that have uh, repaired uh, a gold crown of the king uh, stole the, the gold and put a different metal to that. For Archimedes, that was very difficult because he couldn't destroy the, the, the crown in order to, to assess if, if that was true. The, the only method that he could find by accident, that was a eureka moment, was putting uh, two crowns, one for pure gold, uh, into water and measure how, how much water was displaced. And the, the, the reform, the, the subject of the investigation on the other side. And of course, he discovered that it was adulterated. And, and, uh, but the most important uh, uh, discovery was the fact that uh, this methodology allows very much to calculate how much distance is left uh, and, the, and the correlation between weight and, and volumes. Uh, so with all this contribution, we can understand a little bit more what happened. So we, if we focus on movement, which is exactly what takes us to calculate the distance to default. Uh, movement is basically a combination of uh, space, time, and speed. Uh, and uh, as you can see in the graph, uh, we use what we are uh, familiar to, to manage. Uh, certainly, a, a parallelogram is, is easier to manage in order to calculate uh, volumes. And if you can put uh, an infinite series of parallelograms, they are going to cover the whole area of this curve. And that's exactly what uh, gave the key to calculate how the, the distance in, uh, in, in curves may happen, which is exactly what happens, as we will see, when the default uh, is, is happening. Leibniz uh, also created uh, uh, a very interesting concept, which is uh, the concept of the derivatives, which is uh, little distances between two points. I mean, if you shorten and shorten the point, you can calculate the little distances. And then calculated the distances and taking into consideration the tangent, you can eventually uh, build a curve with a formula. And that formula uh, will certainly help you to have a precise measure of movement. They received the help of uh, Sir William Rowan Hamilton. Uh, Hamilton was an Irish, uh, and uh, he contributed to the understanding of how productively use the Cartesian plane. And he set uh, the formula for a linear equation, which is the one that currently you can use to calculate probability of default. Uh, most of the banks are using that. 
And it's as simple as that. It's uh, y equals m multiplied by x plus b, where m is the slope of the line. This is exactly the contribution that Leibniz gave me. If the slope of the line is the angle to which the line or the curve is moving. In this case, is the, 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 the angle of the tangent. And B is uh, the intercept of Y when X is equal to zero. It's something that creates to what moment it starts uh, or what kind of difference it starts uh, um, in, uh, when, uh, in, the, in the location of certain uh, curve created by the data that you gather. So there was another helper, uh, basically a clergyman, uh, John Wallace. Uh, and John Wallace made a lot of contributions. One of them is that uh, he invented the symbol of infinite. And uh, the Wallace formula helped Newton because he could put different distances using digital components. So for example, the equation of pi is equal to three uh, times 10 uh, elevated to the power zero, which is one. Uh, and then it goes into one elevated at the power 110, uh, and, and then four, 110, and two times, and so on. This is exactly what the computers are using today. This is the way as digital uh, quantities are presented, and, and the calculation that you can uh, see in the computers is exactly this. Why this is relevant? Because this is exactly what help us convert all these equations into algorithms that uh, make easy that the measure of the distance to default can be made using computers. So now let's land into what are, I, I'm trying to express here. What is the pond when we talk about default? The pond is essentially the cash flows of a business. Uh, and basically, uh, here's uh, something that is important that many analysts have uh, re really uh, forgotten to use, which is this very important classification of the statement of cash flows in three groups. The group of operating activities, I mean, how much money comes in and goes out for the running of the business itself, you know, buying and selling, uh, collecting, these are operating activities. Investing activities, that means uh, uh, buying uh, long-term fixed assets in order to grow uh, the business. And, or sometimes it's not only fixed assets, it's, it's acquiring uh, intangible organizations as part of the purpose of the business. And finally, the financing activities, is, which is uh, using other people's money, uh, and in particular, the bank's money. So how much are we repaying the banks and how much are we borrowing from the banks in order to keep our business running. All this nowadays, for those organizations that are subject to US GAAP or for the International Financial Reporting Standards uh, are currently very well defined in, in the corresponding standards. In the case of US GAAP is the ASC 230. In the case of the International Accounting Standards is IIS number seven. All of them describe exactly how you uh, must account with uh, the uh, uh, cash flow statements and how much you can must report uh, your financial uh, statements. So this is very important because when you get into the analytics of any business, I encourage you to pay special attention to these three areas of the cash flows. I love this British show that is, uh, is called uh, Open at All Hours. Uh, it has been for, for many years in, uh, in the BBC uh, broadcasting. Uh, but the explanation of the operating cash flow is exactly ca that goes into the cash register. I mean, the money that goes in and out of the cash registry. The investing cash flow was uh, the money that you take out of the cash registry to buy the bicycle in order to do deliveries. And the financing cash flow was certainly the money that uh, uh, the grocer uh, should borrow in order to keep uh, the business going, be able to pay its uh, suppliers until he can really fill the cash register to be able to repay uh, these, uh, these loans. This is you know, a very simple way to describe these three concepts that are key to understand probability of default. 
Now, for all of you that need to deal in emerging markets, for example, when the, there is a, a no application, no consistent application of uh, the best uh, accounting standards. So the key question is, how can I really read uh, these uh, cash flow statements? And here are some uh, clues about that. One of them is uh, take a look if, uh, if the business files a tax return. Uh, if the business files tax return, you can extract the information from the tax return and the corresponding schedules to the tax return. But if the business doesn't file a tax return, then you can go and, and, and learn whether or not that business has a bank account. Uh, normally, uh, nowadays, most of the business have a bank account. Uh, therefore, if they have a bank account, you can extract details from the bank statements. Uh, if they don't have a bank account, then you need to uh, interview the customer trying to understand how cash goes back and forth. Uh, and the point is that uh, you can uh, and you will need really to understand either from the bank statements from the, from the interview, uh, how to capture the information in order to classify in these three buckets, operating cash flows, investing cash flows, and financing cash flows. And one of the things that is difficult in most of the small businesses, especially in emerging markets, is to differentiate the business income and expenses with the personal ones. I mean, normally one of these grocers in, in uh, you know, the, the, the mom and pop uh, uh, store, uh, they eventually mix everything. They pay the school of their children with uh, the proceeds of the, of the cash register and so on. Well, you can do that because you can consider that the personal expenses are part of the sales, uh, general and administrative cost. Uh, but in any event, uh, once you get all that in place and you can do that uh, digitally today, uh, is not necessarily uh, what used to be the result of, of a manual effort. Now you can do it uh, using, using computers and now using um, artificial intelligence assistance. You can build the operating investment and financial cash flows of this kind of business. Now, once you get there, then we need to detect the ability to pay. And that's where we start becoming uh, detectives. And, and for that purpose, there are uh, two uh, basically uh, approaches. One is uh, calculating financial ratios. And uh, the most important financial ratios are the current ratio, or what is called also the liquidity index, the quick ratio, also, also called the acid test, the working capital, uh, portfolio receivable over work on capital, uh, free cash flow, and comparative analysis. Uh, you compare them over time. Current ratio is basically dividing current assets. I mean, uh, assets that are uh, uh, collectible in less than a year from the time of, uh, of closing the financial statements over uh, current liabilities. The same uh, liabilities that need to be paid in less than a year after the closing of the financial statements. Quick ratio is the same one, but uh, deducting from that the inventories because what this is trying to express is whether or not the business can survive, have enough cash if uh, it stops selling. This was, for example, a very critical ratio during the pandemic when everyone was closed and there were no sales. So do you have enough cash to be able to keep running your business even if you don't sell? Working capital is the amount of, uh, of uh, assets, liquid assets that are left after uh, deducting all uh, current liabilities. Uh, it must be positive in order to keep your business uh, surviving. Portfolio receivable over working capital is taking just the ratio between what you have in receivables, especially customers that are not uh, paying so far over the whole working capital. That will also indicate to you how exposed is the business to the default of their customers. Free cash flow is the result of what the, the, the cash that is generated every year, which is measured by, we will see that by the EBITDA, uh, after deducting from that, uh, the investment made in the investment cash flow, the CAPEX, the capital expenditures. In our case with the grocer, is the investment made in the bicycle, in buying the bicycle. And then it is very important to analyze how these ratios perform over the years because they will give you an idea 
of whether or not the pond is being filled with more water or getting drier, empty. Now, the analytics of these financial ratios have been applied, uh, and we are going to refer to the, the three most important models that are being used. The first one is the Moody's risk calc model, uh, formerly called KMD. The second one is the Standard & Poor's model, and in particular, the credit, uh, credit risk tracker. And the third one is the model, the CITA score from uh, uh, Edward Alman uh, from the University of New York. Uh, so let's uh, take into the first one, which is what, uh, what is today Moody's Analytics, the risk calc model. How did it come to life? And it's called the Merton approach because it, it got the influence of one of the former uh, Nobel Prize economist, uh, Robert Merton. So here's the story. How do we get into the KMV model? 1958 comes, and two economists, Modigliani and Miller, uh, changed the mindset of the current uh, business analytics. People were considering that a business that has had indebtedness was uh, less valuable than another that didn't have any kind of debt. But uh, they change the mindset completely and say, no, 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 wait a minute. You can have a business that could have high indebtedness. Uh, but at the end of the day, what uh, represents the survival of the business is the cash flows that that business is going to generate. So they said, you need to calculate the value of a company, not for the amount of the debt, but uh, taking into consideration how they can generate cash over the years. And I think that that was a very important point because that was taken by Black, Scholes, and Merton in 1973. Uh, and they brought a very interesting, uh, a very interesting theory, which is uh, uh, how to calculate the price of options. Uh, for me, it was not very difficult to understand because in my old years, I used to, uh, to be a stockbroker. And, uh, and I remember that there was uh, a financing organization that was uh, an affiliate to the stock exchange uh, where I work that offered loans to the uh, brokers and to their uh, clients. So th you can buy a stock for a certain price. Let's say that you buy stock for $10 a piece. Uh, and if you pay, for example, a 12% uh, interest rate per year, uh, in the next year, you should uh, uh, return uh, $11.20. $11 if the price of the stock was, let's say, going up from $10 to uh, $15, then what you can do is that you repay the loan, you repay $11.20, and you sell the stock for $15, making a profit of $3.80 per, per, per stock. Well, the rationale that they use is uh, an option to buy is exactly uh, has the same the same behavior of this kind of loans where you are buying something today to pay back in the future uh, that is called a forward operation and a forward transaction uh, sales for future delivery and then of course you pay the financial cost but if the financial cost is lower than the valuation of, of the stock, then you are making money. It could be the, the opposite. It could be that the valuation in our example is not going to be more than 50 cents and we need to pay $1.20 of interest. So we are, we are losing money there. But that's exactly what created the basis for calculating the price of an option. And getting there, Merton made a further step. And the further step was saying, well, Borrowing from Modigliani Miller, and we're trying to define what is the connection between uh, the net worth or the equity of a company and uh, the, the cash flow that they generate or the assets. So, what he uh, basically mentioned is that you need to put that in the language of options. So, when a company uh, has a positive uh, ratio between assets and liabilities, 
uh, that means that the company belongs, has a positive value, belongs to the equity investors. And that means that the capital is a call option of the assets of the company. So that means that the, the investors basically decided to buy the assets and they keep the assets. But if the debt of the company tends to be higher than the amount of the assets, then according to Merton, that means that uh, uh, the debt of the company is a put option and is exercised when the company is insolvent. So applying the same theory of how do we calculate the price of option, probability of default according to this model would be the price of the put option uh, using that calculating formula. So that led them to uh, calculate the concept of EDF, expected default frequency. And the methodology that they apply back in 1995 was calculating the company's stock market value and the volatility of the share price. So in the example I, I gave you uh, before is uh, if, uh, if, uh, if the stock uh, is volatile, that means that eventually is not going to end the next year uh, having a, a price of $15. Uh, probably it could go down to nine or something like that if it has a high volatility. So all that volatility can be measured and can be calculated. The default point is, is then calculated computing the value of the liabilities. I mean, uh, the liabilities will define exactly the price of the put option. And based on the volatility and, uh, and the standard deviation of the expected value of the company, then you can calculate the default point. So the distance to defaults according to this formula is taking the expected market value of the assets less the point of default, which is the price of the option of the put option. And these are calculated considering the expected value of assets multiplied by the asset volatility. So this is, believe it or not, the methodology that uh, drives what today is Moody's analytics. Uh, the point is that uh, the indicator of volatility of assets is based on the measure of the statistics and, and actually has to do with a, a comparative that not necessarily are going to be the same that the company or the business you are analyzing uh, has behaving. So for example, if you are analyzing uh, an artisanal uh, beer uh, manufacturer by comparing its business with uh, Ambev Inbev, which is the largest brewery in the world, uh, probably is not the best indicator. And the volatility of the, of the stock of Ambev Inbev it has nothing to do with the real uh, financial health of uh, this uh, artisan uh, brewing company. So this is one of the of the downsides that I, I could see in this model. But the model was uh, was nice. It was full of uh, mathematical equations. Uh, and uh, the gentlemen that gave the name to the KMB, Akil Holler, Macon, and Vasicek, uh, when they combine volatility to network to calculate the distance to default, uh, basically made so attractive uh, this uh, methodology that Moody's decide to acquire them and put that into motion under the name of risk calc. And I remember that when I started uh, advising one of the largest leasing companies uh, on earth that was at and Capital, the credit rating uh, methodology was based in risk calc. So every single business should be run uh, through risk calc. Did the people who run these uh, businesses uh, through risk calc uh, really understand how risk calc work? Certainly not. But you know, it was the the, the methodology that the company has uh, has chosen, and that was supported by the fact that uh, that Moody's is a very well known name uh, and very reputable company. I, I would say that it, it, they do things very well, but I'm not sure that this model is the best one to calculate the distance to default. Uh, so, if you want to uh, drill down in mathematics, then you can take this equation, which is exactly the equation that the Black Scholes uh, uses, and is the same equation that you can uh, convert into the analytics of uh, the uh, distance to default. So let's move into the Standard & Poor's model. Uh, Standard & Poor's launched the credit model uh, in 2003 and the credit risk tracker in 2007. 
uh, the talking about credit model, uh, what they did is that uh, they use a, a, a database of credit ratings uh, using a statistical techniques uh, that help them associate financial information with ratings. We're going to see how they apply certain number of, of financial ratios. Then the statistical methodology that they use was the exponential density theory, which is a theory that applies the law of large numbers. And I invite you to go back to our episode number four, where we talk extensively about the law of large numbers. But to give you an idea where we are talking about is uh, that was originated in the statistics of mortality uh, and based on the frequency of large quantities of data, then uh, uh, a behavior could be calculated or estimated and was distributed into what is called a Gaussian distribution uh, that, uh, that created or led to the concept of the standard deviation and so on. Uh, but at the end of the day, what happens here, and I think that during the pandemic, we learn a little bit of the fact that the uh, Gaussian distributions, what we predict is going to happen in the normal world, uh, certainly doesn't happen because we tend to neglect, to ignore what is called fat tail distributions. Some data that are a little bit uh, outside of our uh, sight uh, uh, tunnel vision, and this is precisely what uh, sometimes uh, creates uh, surprises for us. In uh, calculating distance to default or probability to default, you cannot afford to ignore that. And that's one of the main criticisms when you use these kind of large uh, numbers uh, methodology. So what is it that what the credit risk tracker does? It is a predictive model of probability of default, very widely used. And it mixes uh, three basic uh, group of concepts. Uh, 30 macroeconomic variables, 43 financial variables that are divided in seven groups. I'm going to go to the seven groups now. And seven sectoral or industry uh, variables. So the seven groups for the financial are in-depthness. It's fine. How, how, uh, how uh, in-depth is a company, how much uh, other people's money they are using. Liquidity, which is another good uh, measure. Profitability, is the business making money or not? Size, that's when I think they are unfair because there are a lot of small businesses that are credit worthy, but because of uh, the fact that they don't pass the exam of size, they are excluded from the possibility of getting financing in the institutions that use this model. A structure has to do uh, with the legal uh, support of, uh, of uh, the financing. Efficiency, uh, that has to do with uh, how the balance between revenues and costs at different areas uh, are going to work, and growth, which shows uh, certainly if the business is going up or down. These are the variables that Credit Risk Tracker uses, is the CRT, and that was launched into the marketplace in 2006. Now, uh, you are, of course, invited to drill down a little bit more. Uh, in the book, probably we give a little bit more explanation about these methods, but I, I didn't want to, uh, to uh, bore you. I, I just wanted to explain the, the basics and what is the reason why we don't uh, really buy 100% these concepts. Uh, but on the other hand, if you want to buy them, uh, the important part is, to, is that, that you understand how they work. Probably the analytics that they use is something that you uh, share. You may disagree with me in the fact that I don't believe that the law of large numbers is the right approach to calculate probability of default. But, uh, well, this is exactly what uh, can uh, give us to different conclusions on the same experience. So getting into what we call our lambda model, we decided to put lambda, it's, it's, a, it's a Greek letter that, uh, that uh, is very expressive. Uh, the starting point is analyzing the work of Alman, which is the one that probably uh, is more uh, uh, alike to our line of work. And, and let me make uh, here a, a brief uh, explanation of this. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I was educated as a civil law lawyer. Uh, a civil law lawyer has a school of logics that has to do a lot with fitting a legal text with the factual situation. If it's a perfect fit because the law, the written law provides clear 
governance of the situation that happened. Uh, certainly the, the, the legal decision, either by contract or by uh, judgment, uh, is going to be very simple to define. It came into, uh, you know, in a, in a sales and purchase contract, uh, the purchaser must pay the price. There is a law that provides for that. If uh, he failed to pay the price, of course, he's in breach of the law. But it may happen that there are other situations that where there are no specific law is not a fit. So you need to use analogy. And of course, the use of analogy is a very risky use. For that reason, every time anyone uses analogy to analyze probability of default, I tend to be very distrustful with that. I, I tend to really uh, think again that probably there should be a better uh, method to find probability of default in something that really certainly should fit as opposed to borrowing from someone else's experience in order to fit that into your experience. Uh, so that's what attracted me of the approach taken by Alman. Alman, again, I would say is a kind of forensic uh, analyst. I mean, probably he, he started in the morgue of, uh, of businesses, uh, but also he went to the bright side of businesses. And making this analysis as if why companies went out of business, number one, what were the common illnesses that these companies had? And what are the, the characteristics, the features of the companies that are most uh, uh, profitable and, and, has, and gain more value? Uh, he came out to understand that the key ratios that would explain either the mortality of the companies or the business and or it, the, their fine health were these four ratios, only four. And these four ratios were number one, the ratio between working capital and total assets. Number two, the ratio between retained earnings and total assets. Number three, the ratio between earnings before interest and taxes and total assets. Note that no depreciation allowances are here, only earnings before interest and taxes. Depreciation is deducted from that. And ratio number four, total equity over total liabilities. So one of the things that called my attention was the ratio number one. Uh, why is important? And, and I learned that by experience when I was representing uh, a US company, Manpower, when we were in an acquisition in South America. And I remember that the target company had very valuable investments in real estate. And one of the conditions that my client imposed to me when they were representing them, he said, uh, you need to demand to them to, uh, to uh, take away all the real estate investment they have because we are not going to buy that. And I went up to them and, well, you can earn a lot of money if you buy that because they, these are good properties, the evaluation of the properties are excellent, you can make a lot of money. And they said, no. Actually, what we want to focus is in the ability of the business to generate working capital because the better working capital the company has over its total assets, the, the better financial condition they are going to have. Uh, that was a good lesson. The second ratio, retained earnings over total assets, shows exactly how strong are the savings of the company so that in a downturn, they can survive. And I think this is something that was absolutely important in all this process. EBIT over total assets is a very important point. How efficiently are you using your assets? Uh, it will be very interesting to see the higher the, the earnings that you can uh, get from your assets, the most productive, the most efficient you are going to be. And ratio number four is, is not the, uh, difficult to understand how, how heavily uh, uh, indebted are, uh, is your company. So using all this, and now you apply statistics, of course, but the study applies statistics in a different way, in a more inductive and not deductive way, he came out to calculating and using uh, uh, the, the linear equation methodology, uh, this equation that uh, goes to the definition of the Z score, which is, uh, uh, I have been using the Z score in the last uh, 20 years, and it has proven to be 
very accurate. Uh, so they use here the slope. Remember the slope concept, apply 655, apply to ratio number one, working capital over total assets. The slope of 326 apply to ratio number two. 672 apply to ratio number three, EBIT over total assets. And 1.05 apply to ratio number four. For emerging markets, he had a, uh, an intersect of 3.25. Out of emerging markets, this 325 disappears. So what the C-score told us, what uh, Alman told us, is that according to the observations, again, which companies go to the more, which companies are in the best position. Uh, so all of that that has a Z value greater than 5.85, uh, is in a safety zone. That is, they are very remote risk of default. If the value between is between 435 and 585, the companies say to be in a gray zone, medium risk of, of default or bankruptcy. But if the value is less than 435, then we are in a risky uh, situation. And of course, uh, there is a high probability according to the calculation and other statistics of mortality, company exhibiting less than, or business exhibiting less than 435C score uh, went bankrupt uh, in two years. So based upon that, and using the scale that the Standard & Poor's made popular, that goes from AAA to single D, uh, that's 20 level of probability of default, uh, correlating to the C score, this is the table. And, and as I told you, I have been applying this table in the last uh, uh, 20 or 25 years, uh, what we do is that we created an algorithm in an Excel file that uh, automatically give us the rating of a customer just inputting the, the information. And as I mentioned to you, that became very accurate. However, and that uh, take us to the role to Lamba. Uh, trying to build something better, there are some things that, uh, I believe that Alman left out. And then we came back to our original analysis, uh, which is how is the way a sapond is emptied? So that take us back to analyzing the behavior of cash flow from operations, the financing cash flow, and the investment cash flow. And then the first point that we need to focus is on uh, the current ratio or liquidity index, which, uh, as, as we defined uh, earlier, is the ratio between short-term assets and short-term liabilities. What that indicates is the, the buffer. Uh, I mean, how many uh, water uh, has, and, and of course, when, uh, when the company uh, has a very low liquidity ratio, they are very likely to default because it's clearly they don't have enough money to pay their current liabilities. Uh, if they are a little bit better, then uh, liquidity ratio could be considered a medium risk, but it's still they are struggling. They are struggling in order to be able to meet their obligations. If the current ratio is higher, uh, that will indicate that the, the situation is, is, uh, is sound and uh, that, that will take uh, this business into the lowest risk uh, range in the, in the scale that has been used. Uh, so you can analyze uh, on the current ratio different ranges because that will indicate in a way how easy the money is taking out of the business, is getting out of the business. And that generally is associated to the operating cash flow. Same goes to the quick ratio. The quick ratio has to do with uh, how much money is left uh, if you disregard the inventories? If you uh, just assume that you are not going to sell any single piece of uh, merchandise that you have in inventory. Uh, well, certainly that will give you uh, the idea of uh, the ability to pay of that business if you don't sell. Uh, as I mentioned before, during the pandemic, that was a very good indicator. Uh, but also it can indicate how reliable how dependent is a business to be able to meet obligations of the volume sales. So 
if you are predicting, like today we have uh, received uh, the report from the International Monetary Fund, we say, beware, recession could be around the corner. Uh, a lot of economists are going to tell us, oh yes, beware of recession. So if we need to be, uh, you know, prepare for recession, uh, certainly we need to put more attention to the quick ratio of the businesses we are analyzing. Because something may happen in, in a recession, which is they are going to sell less. And the question is how much liquidity are they going to have if they cannot really uh, sell or at least at the levels that they need to sell. Now, again, focusing in the operating cash flow, but now combining that with the financing cash flow, working capital is going to indicate us the, what is left after deducting from the short-term assets, the amount of short-term liabilities. And of course, it will give us a, a good measure of whether or not there is sufficient water in the pond to cover the obligations associated with the new credit that you are uh, undertaking. Now, if the working capital is, uh, is enough to cover obligations, uh, uh, including your new loan that you are doing, then, uh, then you could be in a good situation, but you need to analyze whether or not, what is the trend if the working capital is going up or going down? because that will lead you to the point to see whether or not the pond is being filled or getting drier. Uh, and clearly we have, unfortunately, a, a big uh, uh, deal. If a large company, we were uh, trying to get some, some uh, uh, financing to that company. And we got the surprise when we received the financial statements that they have negative working capital. Uh, and the, the, the funny thing is a lot of large institutions have provided uh, uh, credit to that company, disregarding the fact that that company has a negative working capital. So these are the kind of things that uh, you really don't understand. And we are talking about banks that are very strict in their credit standards. So the next ratio is how exposed you are to the credit risk of your client's clients. I mean, you are financing uh, let's say, uh, a factory that sells cars. Hmm? And uh, cars are sold generally on credit terms. Of course, there are third parties and the banks are very happy to, to provide that kind of, of financing. But in general terms, if uh, cars are, 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 are financed by the same uh, manufacturer, or by the same uh, distributor, the same vendor, if the customers fail to pay, then this is going to affect their liquidity. So one of the uh, rules of thumb is that uh, if the portfolio receivable uh, or ratio to, uh, uh, to working capital is less than 50%, uh, then of course that, that means that uh, uh, we are not really being transferred the, the, the credit risk of the customers. Uh, if it's greater than 50%, then we will need to understand how solid uh, are their clients because if uh, we could be victims of a default in chain if we have high exposure in this ratio of portfolio receivable over, over working capital. Now, the key question in the, in the operating cash flow is if, if the client's business is good or bad. And the key to that is going to be given by the free cash flow. Free cash flow is basically uh, what uh, the generation of operating cash flow which is the EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation allowances, uh, is left after we buy the bicycle of the grocer. After we expand, we put the capital expenditures in, into play. And let me give a parenthesis to that because it's something that has been very, very important. For all of us that have been in the business of equipment financing, uh, this key ratio is something that has been ignored by the sales force of uh, who sells, for example, uh, the product of leasing, uh, because we have been focusing now on the tax advantage or the accounting advantage or balance sheet financing, but we have neglected the most important role of equipment financing, which is it takes away from the business the burden of investing in capital expenditures. Mm -hmm. So in the case of the grocer, if the grocer leads the bicycle,
from a leasing company instead of buying, the free cash flow of that company would be higher. And this is something that is important to be learned. Uh, but anyway, here we have a situation where if the free cash flow is greater than the value of the principal interest of the liabilities, I mean, the ability to have a strong operating cash flow that can overcome what goes net out from the financing cash flow, that is going to show you certainly that uh, the business is in a safe situation. Otherwise, if the financing cash flow is taking more cash than one is generated by the operating cash flow, certainly we are going to be in a position of a decreasing uh, existence of water in the pond, and therefore we are going to be subject to a greater probability of default. The next point that you uh, should analyze is the efficiency analysis. How efficient is the customer to generate profits? And there is interesting because it has been a very good tool to diagnose uh, the, the way as a business is becoming financially efficient. And that is called the DuPont model. Here, when we have another contribution from science that was uh, brought by Frank Donaldson Brown, uh, not very well known, unfortunately, but probably is one of the most influential uh, in uh, in good practices of uh, in good financial practices of managing business. His story is is very interesting because he was the financial chief financial officer of Dupont. DuPont is a very interesting company that was founded by a French immigrant into the United States at the time of the independence wars in the United States. And the business of DuPont, Monsieur Etienne DuPont de, de, de Demou, was to manufacture powder that was used as ammunition during the war. When the war was over, so the question was, what are we going to do with all these assets that we have in this company? And they said, okay, well, powder is essentially a, a chemical product. So he started diversifying using the same infrastructure to manufacture some other chemical products. When Donaldson Browns arrives in the early 20th century to that company, the company has expanded. Uh, they have diversified because uh, certainly they move into different kinds of uh, of chemicals, and they were, for example, manufacturing the seats for the cars that were the new product. And eventually, DuPont decided to come in to invest into, into uh, General Motors. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that where uh, Donaldson Brown was, was uh, put there. General Motors was in a very bad shape. So he decided to put into motion his analytical tool, the DuPont model. And the DuPont model was as well decided that one of the key users uh, down the road of the DuPont model was uh, Robert McNamara uh, when he uh, was appointed as uh, CEO of four motor credit companies before he became uh, director of the Pentagon during the Kennedy administration. So what is the key of the of the DuPont model is, is very simple. The rationale that he has is at the end of the day, a business is efficient if it generates an adequate return on investment. And the way to measure that request on uh, return on investment is using the measure of return on equity. Return on equity is how much equity are generating is generating the business how much net income is generated in business for the equity owners? That is the return on equity. How do you get there? And that's the interesting part. He came step by step. You know, the same methodology of calculus, splitting everything in, in little pieces was taken here as the methodology to get analyzing the different steps of the business. So I say, how do I get to a good and sustainable return on equity? I need to pay attention, number one, on the return of sales. And the return of sales is the result of net income over revenue. How do I get to net income? 
to get to net income, then I take my revenue, I deduct the cost of sales, that gives me my gross profit. Then I take out my operating expenses, my fixed cost, salaries, uh, rentals, everything I need to pay, whether or not I have revenues, then plus or less interest, depending if I receive interest or I pay interest, less income taxes, and that will give you the net income. So here, the interesting part of that is that what DuPont did is that from here, he went into conditioning the different variables that took us here. But the analytics was very important because it gets into this other variable, which is extremely relevant, which is the asset turns. How many times the sales turn over the, the assets? Is the, is the ratio between revenue and assets. So if the revenue is less than one, the revenue over assets is less than one, that is a sample that the efficiency of the business is not very good. And that goes back to my story of my uh, representation of uh, manpower, uh, because that was part of the story. Let's discharge this business of a lot of assets that may not be productive assets for the business purposes, for the operating cash flow. And let's focus on what generates revenues. So if we have at least sales are higher than assets, we are in a good shape. If sales are lower than assets, we may be in trouble because this is going to lower all these ratios then that will give us, as a result, the return on assets. It's just taking net income divided by revenue. I mean, just as an algebraic uh, ratio, you eliminate this revenue and this revenue, and you're going to get return of assets, net income over assets. That is return on assets. I have the tendency to focus more in the return on assets as a good metric. When we are analyzing, for example, business that are target for acquisitions, on where we are analyzing business for the purposes of uh, financial analysis. But then, then you need to take into consideration the in-depthness of the company. And that's total assets over equity, that's financial leverage. Then multiplying return on assets times financial leverage will take you to the return on equity. Now, if you analyze the business under this methodology, every year you can identify where the sickness is located, where are the symptoms and what, are, what kind of the cure you can find in any kind of business. And this is especially relevant today when you are going to face a lot of restructurings. We have a recession down the corner. We need to be prepared to having all this kind of analysis because this is exactly what will give us the key about whether or not a business is going to be viable or not. And of course, as consultants, it'll help us very much to help our clients to focus on this, like Mr. Donaldson Brown did in its time, and turn around General Motors. Now, taking of what we have learned here, you know, how can you really see the, the behavior of the operating cash flow, the investment cash flow, and the financing cash flow over the years, over the time? Then our friends Archimedes and Newton is, are going to give us the measure. So you simply take these four ratios and then a, a fifth one, which is uh, was not included by Altman at the beginning. And this fifth one is X5, which is EBITDA less interest expenses over total assets. Because what this shows is how much financial costs are taken away from the operating cash flow. So you can analyze the different, you, you analyze the ability that has the business to generate more liquidity over total assets, the efficiency of the business, EBIT over total assets, is, is, is taking a derivative of DuPont. The return earn is the power performance, how much savings the business has in order to, uh, to afford a, a downturn situation. From the investment uh, cash flow variables, you can take then the free cash flow on assets, a bit less capital investment over total assets, because that is going to show as again what is the tendency. So if you have, for example, here 
these are the, the ratios, then you can calculate, Excel can calculate for you the quadrat, the, the linear formula. And that linear formula will give you the key to calculate your uh, score of, of, of the business. Uh, of course, we are not going to get the final uh, session is the one that is going to uh, focus on the final result of how the business, how, how the model of, of the Lambda score is built in detail. But I wanted to give you these general ideas of how science help us measure probability of default. So I want to thank you for participating in this event. It's the first time I, I do a, a live in LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, I invite you to join me for the next episode. I will be inviting you using LinkedIn as well. Uh, and it's basically uh, taking a review of what has been the approach that regulators are taking, especially financial regulators, uh, with respect to probability of default. So having said this, I want to thank you very much for participating in this event. Uh, I hope that uh, you uh, uh, were able to enjoy this. Uh, I don't have a clear visibility of how many of you attended the event, uh, but uh, for anyone who wants to follow up, uh, uh, LinkedIn is going to keep this event uh, uh, recorded. And I will also upload to our YouTube channel this event if you want to watch it again. And most of what has been said here can be read in the book of Probability of Default. So again, I want to thank you very much for joining in this, uh, in this event. And uh, I will be ready to answer any questions online using the, the LinkedIn platform. For the time being, uh, I just uh, want to, to wish you a wonderful rest of the day and a very productive one. And I hope that this event helped you uh, learn a little bit as I have been learning a little bit on how to measure probability of default using science. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.